My name is Michelle Provost. I'm a, a partner in Crimson Architectural Historians and also the director of the International Newtown Institute. Some time ago I came across uh, an image, a design for a big city called the Great City, very uh, abruptly, um, which is a new design for a city in China near the city of Chengdu. And it is uh, a city for half a million people located near the metropolis, but in the middle of a green uh, area, completely um, sustainably designed and uh, dependent on, on uh, public transport. But I think it's mainly the, uh, the part where it becomes uh, a part of the countryside in the, in the, in the green area surrounding Chenghu uh, that made the uh, architects compare it to the garden city, the garden city of uh, Ebenezer Howard. Um, its circular shape in the countryside is what it has in common with the, the model that we know from a century ago from Ebenezer Howard. And as you know, this garden city idea was the idea of, of finding the balance, like the uh, best of both worlds, between the city and the countryside by uh, providing all the economic and social possibilities of the city and at the same time providing the space and the, the lack of pollution of the countryside. So this best of both worlds was the idea that Howard put forward as the garden city, which had, has had an amazingly long life for more than a century now. Uh, but with, it's soon forgotten that it also had a very important social content, not only uh, a formal part, so the way that it, after still after a century, is being repeated as a, a circular shape in the countryside is a bit cynical when you look at the uh, original revolutionary aspirations that Howard had with his city, with his garden city, which was supposed to uh, be a collaborative um, uh, effort of its inhabitants. But uh, this uh, social content and its revolutionary aspirations never really became true. But it shows how a formal aspect in urban planning can have a really long life. And this is especially the case with the garden city in the 20th century. So the, the concept that Howard made um, became popular uh, after a few decades after he uh, designed it, after he conceived it, and especially after the uh, Second World War in uh, London when there was uh, the New Towns Act, a big plan uh, conceived for uh, the, the UK to deal with the housing shortage and con um, uh, designing a number of 20-some new towns surrounding the big cities. In, by that time, the social content had already shifted into a welfare state uh, utopia, you could say, uh, based on the neighborhood principle uh, small units of walkable uh, area, each having their own amenities, schools, shops, etc., with um, a sort of suburban housing for um, workers and lower middle class alike, and uh, lots of space for the collective. So each neighborhood had its own collective center and its own um, collective space, which was one of the, like the thresholds of the welfare state uh, society in uh, England. And though it was conceived um, in the UK, it, was, uh, it be soon became a very popular concept. And this was partly because it was so easy to explain. Hello. Hello. Morning. My, I can remember like it was yesterday. Good. It wasn't half so comfortable. It took a bloke a good hour to get to work. Let's start by seeing how our town looked 150 years ago. Small, compact, thriving, small population. Then the Industrial Revolution happened. Industry moved into the town. It needed workers. Here, outside the green belt, we have a favourable site. Good road and rail communications, fresh air, good water supply. We must decide on its size in advance. And we must plan this town so that we don't repeat past mistakes. 
Our town was going to be a good place to work in and a grand place to live in, with plenty of open spaces, parks, and playing fields where people could enjoy them. Of course, there'd have to be an attractive town centre too, with plenty of room for folks to meet. Good shops, a posh theatre, cinemas, a concert hall and a civic centre. So, this combination between Howard's concept of the Garden City and industrialised uh, planning and building, uh, the idea of the collective and the small-scale neighbourhood principle, uh, became one package that was uh, exported outside of the borders of the UK and um, it soon travelled to the other side of the canal, to the Netherlands for instance, where it was exhibited and where all the professionals took in this idea and uh, it became hugely popular. So in each country it became executed, uh, mingled with uh, local concepts like uh, the, the, the family as a cornerstone of society, which was the concept in, uh, in Holland and then moved on to Germany, to Scandinavia, until it sort of spread all over the countries of uh, Western Europe. And in the beginning it was uh, a hugely uh, popular and successful uh, concept, until we didn't even uh, only see this concept in the Western European countries, but we also saw it on Australia, and we saw it in uh, Scandinavia, and we saw it in uh, Northern Korea even, or in uh, Mongolia. So all these different uh, countries with their different local cultures and politics adopted this kind of new towns as, um, as the, the panacea for uh, urban growth in the post-war years. So it became the model of the welfare state. A completely different concept than uh, Howard had originally uh, meant it to be, but nonetheless still uh, a quite an idealistic and also a political uh, concept in which uh, architects, politicians, policy makers, uh, builders, the whole of society of this um, uh, civil um, society was engaged. So that period lasted, you could say, up until uh, the 80s. Uh, but recently, of course, we're in a very uh, different period and um, after the demise of the welfare state, also um, the change of politics is being reflected in the, the way that our cities are being built. So this kind of welfare state cities are not being built anymore, but what, are, what kind of cities are being built? And um, to get an answer on that question, you don't have to look to Western Europe or the United States. This is not the place where uh, cities are being built these days. Um, economic growth has shifted to, uh, to Asia, and this is the place where also large new metropolises are being uh, planned and built. So if you want to see what actually are the latest developments in urban planning, then you would have to turn east. Uh, for this reason, uh, at the uh, Newtown Institute, we made this publication, Rising in the East, which is like an inventory and an analysis of uh, the present day uh, generation of new cities. And um, what it becomes very, very clear is that these, uh, this new generation also bears a lot of resemblances to each other. Those, so you could call them neoliberal cities, and they have a lot of the same uh, aspects. And notably, uh, they all start from uh, huge CBD with skyscrapers, uh, lots of leisure, lots of um, um, icon, architectural icons, um, usually a car-dependent infrastructure uh, taking shape of a grid. And uh, again, this is not only taking place in Asia, in South Korea or in China, as you may expect, but now also is being exported to uh, countries in Africa, countries in uh, South America. So there is a new generation um, turning up on the map of neoliberal cities, uh, which are very different from, the, from what we actually know in a number of aspects. For starters, um, the welfare state cities were usually um, built because of an overflow, an overspill of population from the big cities that were already there. In this case, uh, the new generation is often started uh, by the uh, initiators um, as economic cities to sort of colonize a specific area uh, and to attract investments, foreign investments in that area. 
So uh, you could call these economic cities, which have uh, like the, the kickstart or the, the, the turbo boost of a, a national economy as its, uh, as its goal. So they're economic cities. Uh, in the second place, they um, uh, are usually sustainable cities or advised with uh, sustainable cities because a lot of this is greenwashing. But the um, uh, eco city uh, label um, is connected to a lot of these uh, new cities. And for a part, this could be really interesting for Western Europe because it is easier to experiment with uh, ecological ex um, uh, new inventions and innovation. Uh, in transport, in infrastructure, in building also. And uh, there could be some examples for Western Europe here. The third um, uh, trend that you could perceive in these neoliberal cities is the abundance of high tech. So um, there's uh, new players involved in this urban planning, like Cisco, for instance, Siemens or Philips, uh, which have to suddenly have uh, an interest in urban planning because of uh, it being a new market for their products and basically their software and the hardware networks. So uh, the uh, abundance of high tech is something very visible and very present in, uh, in this city and also becomes one of the attractions of, uh, of, this, of this generation. Another thing which is uh, high on the list of um, uh, characteristics of these new cities is the focus on identity and branding. So many of these cities actually have uh, an architectural uh, core which is being designed as uh, a in a specific European style, be it an Italian village or uh, Thames Town, or which is based on London uh, classic architecture. There's even a Holland village. I'm not sure if there's a, a Russian village, but I'm sure there will be one. And uh, these uh, architectural cores form the um, uh, identity of a city and also are meant to attract visitors and uh, inhabitants. So identity, branding, uh, marketing, that's all part of the, of the package of these, uh, of these new cities. So these cities are in a completely different part of the world uh, than we are. And this is a reason for a lot of people to regard this as something not very relevant to us at all. So um, you see uh, in the architecture schools, you see a, a huge focus on self-organized building, on slums, on favelas, and all those really interesting subjects. But um, these large planned cities are usually um, a lot less popular. And uh, it might have to do something with that they're in a different part of the world, but also that they are um, designed by a different kind of um, architecture firms than um, are teaching at the uh, architecture schools. But still, they are a very important subject next to the self-organized cities, I would say. Um, but what is interesting to see is that um, the avant-garde um, architecture offices uh, are not connected to this new generation of new towns. This is uh, usually a matter of the export of Western uh, offices like uh, KPF, HOK, a lot of Dutch offices, uh, KCAP. There's also some uh, German ones, but there is a huge export of uh, Western urban models to um, East Asia. And um, this, so we are connected in a way. And there is definitely a strong connection between the West and these uh, new cities. Only there is one layer missing, I would say, and this is where the architecture schools and where more avant-garde and theoretical uh, offices should step in and um, um, infuse these cities with their ideas and their practice. So while in the 50s and 60s these welfare state cities were initiated, planned and built and most of the time also financed by uh, the local or the central government, nowadays this is completely different. So um, the, the newest generation is very much the result of a privatized urban planning. And this also means that we are dealing with a lot of uh, different uh, players. So it's like private market parties who are uh, now getting engaged in urban planning and they're uh, play, taking over a role that traditionally was being played by governments. The privatization of this urban planning, what exactly does it mean and what are the, the, the qualities attached to these new cities or the lack of qualities, you could also ask. This is something important to uh, investigate. 
And um, we did this for an exhibition at the Biennale of uh, Venezia uh, called The Banality of Good. And we researched for 50 new towns, starting from the immediate post-war years up to now, um, how the um, uh, groups, the income groups and the groups of people living there were actually um, uh, designed. So uh, how the city was designed for, sp for specific uh, groups. And uh, we found out some very um, simple, but quite um, uh, clearly and quite shocking results also, uh, which is that there was a, a very clear trend from the post-war years uh, from uh, sheltering the, the poor to housing the rich. So um, if you look at the cities built in around London immediately after the war, they're basically built for uh, workers and lower, lower middle class. While if you look at the, the new cities, which are, belong to the most recent generation, um, then they are built for the upper middle class and the upper, upper middle class. So there is a clear shift uh, from which incomes are actually catered for by these, uh, by these new cities. That's the first trend. The second thing is, um, who builds these cities? The cities in the post-war years were initiated by the government and also uh, built, planned and financed by them. Uh, and now there's a clear shift uh, to private capital and to private market parties uh, initiating them and also to a shift from a local money to global money. So often it's now multinationals coming in into a different country investing and financing these uh, cities. We made some uh, visuals um, illustrating this uh, uh, effect um, using different examples of uh, cities from the immediate post-war period and of the most uh, recent generation. Um, like you can see, Stevenage was actually the very first new town uh, built next to uh, London. And for what reason? You can see that on the left. Because London was considered to be um, a huge, polluted, overcrowded uh, metropolis. And the train and the car made it possible to go outside of this metropolis and, and move somewhere else live somewhere else, and this would be possible for all kinds of incomes, but especially for workers. Um, the, um, on the right-hand side you can see what the idea was behind this, the formal and the architectural ideas, and this dated back to the ideas of Howard, to have like this separate city on a little bit of distance between, uh, with uh, the metropolis, so there would be like a safe distance, so to speak, with, uh, between the metropolis and the new city. Um, and it, this is combined with a neighborhood principle by uh, Clarence Steen. So, and then there was obviously this welfare state combination with a very strong policy uh, maker, um, like the, the labor uh, government, which actually pushed this New Towns uh, Act and made it possible that they were built. And in the middle you see the, the kind of model that was adopted for these new towns, an industrialized garden city model uh, with uh, enough place for the collective and for meeting each other and to have like a shopping collective social environment. So this is the whole story of, uh, of this first uh, generation of post-war new towns, aiming at progress, at the collective, and uh, at this welfare state utopia. The privatized city is, is completely uh, different. Uh, differently built and also built for, for different reasons. In the case of um, uh, this example is Alphaville Tambouré, which is in the outskirts of uh, Sao Paulo. Um, the reason for building this city is basically to flee from the existing city because of its unsafety, because of its pollution, and um, because of the well, the, the perceived um, lack of, of safety for middle-class uh, incomes. So um, Alphaville Tamoré is basically built for upper-middle-class uh, people. Um, the model which is being used uh, for this city it goes back to the uh, American suburb with cul-de-sacs and um, the, the whole organization behind this um, is a private organization of a developer using marketing tools, using even up to the point of uh, having a, a special television channel and a soap uh, 
um, to market this uh, city to uh, attract uh, inhabitants. And the result, um, as you can see in the middle, is also very basically uh, different from this uh, whole set of the neighborhood surrounding this collective node of the shopping center. The shopping center in this case is outside uh, the, the housing environment, basically located on the, on the highway. And the housing areas are um, fenced in, have a, are gated communities, and uh, mainly consist of uh, villas, separate villas, freestanding, uh, and the high end of the market, and they're all uh, guarded by um, fences and a gate, of course, with uh, some uh, policemen guarding it. Well, probably the most uh, interesting, because it's very extreme, interesting example uh, of this new privatized cities is uh, New Songdo in uh, South Korea. It is interesting because it is completely based on a concept of um, high-tech being ubiquitously provided for uh, its inhabitants. So it's completely um, a, a network, completely connected. Uh, medical, educational, uh, commercial services are all available for the businesses and inhabitants who move to uh, New Songdo. And this is one of the big uh, attractions of the city and makes it hugely uh, popular. Um, it is being advertised by its developer, Stan Gill, an American developer, uh, as uh, a city in a box. So um, previously we, we knew of standardized buildings, we know of standardized furniture, but now um, we are speaking of uh, standardized cities. And uh, actually, New Songdo has, as a complete package, already been sold twice to different parts of uh, China. So this is taking standardization to the next level. Uh, irrespective of context and, and local culture, uh, this whole concept of the city is being uh, exported and repeated. Um, so we could ask ourselves, is this uh, really a good answer to the uh, growing urbanization and does it given a solution to that? Or is this uh, just a, a way to uh, earn money for clever developers? Maybe the most amazing uh, aspect of such a new city, which uh, is based on a new concept of high-tech uh, ubiquitous um, uh, software, is how uh, amazingly familiar it looks. Because it was actually uh, designed first by OMA, and then this plan was um, redone by the American office of KPF. But now if you look at the image of the resulting city, you basically see uh, a car city with a highway grids and um, uh, glass skyscrapers. So uh, none of this new concept is actually visible in the shape of this city. So it doesn't necessarily, these new concept of organization, finance and uh, the, um, uh, the high-tech running of the city don't necessarily reflect in the, uh, in the image of the city. This kind of uh, experiments with uh, smart cities, as they are called, uh, are now increasingly becoming uh, popular in Western Europe uh, as well. And we see uh, little bits and pieces popping up in uh, existing cities. Not on the scale that we see in, uh, in Asia, but the popularity is growing. Um, and also the um, aspect of the, the, the characteristic of uh, uh, developing a city by a private corporation uh, is taking shape in Western Europe as well. Also on a little bit different scale, but it is happening. Uh, an example is uh, the IKEA group that we know from furniture, uh, also has uh, a real estate group called uh, Inter IKEA. Uh, and has th this group has redeveloped a part of uh, eastern London, uh, which was uh, filled with uh, old warehouses and uh, close to the Olympic um, uh, area. And it is basically done in uh, a very familiar way as well. So also here this uh, different organization doesn't really show because what we see is um, a small scale uh, pedestrianized environment uh, with all kinds of uh, different streetscapes, 
uh, no skyscrapers uh, in this case, but a quite European um, um, uh, urban image. And uh, the um, invisible aspects are actually the most important because Inter-IKEA will be connected to this area for a longer period, like two or three decades, will also be in charge of uh, renting the houses, but also doing the healthcare, uh, will be involved with education, so they will be like the paterfamilias of all this, of all this area. Uh, there's different concepts in private cities, that is for sure. Um, Inter-IKEA has started this um, uh, development in uh, East London, in this area called Strand East, uh, by means of um, uh, making a restaurant in one of the old warehouses. So as it becomes a destination, it becomes a place already, they built a tower and this will be the, the starting point for their redevelopment of this whole area. So another example in Western Europe, uh, which is, also seems to be radically different from the way that we know urban planning, is uh, a city being planned in Portugal uh, called Planet Valley. And it's being planned by an IT company, Living Planet, uh, which also gives you an idea of how important IT is for this uh, city. And basically, it's the backbone for the whole city. And uh, by licensing this network to uh, partnering businesses, um, this organization also has come up with a whole new financial model. So it's not family capital like with uh, IKEA, and it's not um, capital from the bank like in New Songdo, but in this case the uh, capital for building the city comes from the businesses who are attracted to form part of this uh, coalition using the network. And um, it will be uh, yeah, almost a business city in the, in the northern uh, of Portugal. So it is really interesting that these new financial models are being thought up. But on the other hand, we could also ask, uh, what are these cities more than financial models? Because a financial model uh, should never be a goal in itself. The goal is to improve the quality of our cities. So how do these financial models actually help? And this is something that needs a lot of discussion because what you see now is often that these financial models are actually thought of as um, uh, separate autonomous uh, concepts which uh, have in a technocratic way an influence on the city but are not thought of from the point of view of this bigger cultural conception of a city. Um, and of course, this technology um, that we see in New Songdo, but also in uh, Planet Valley, puts another question. For whom is this technology really meant? Is it for the people who can afford it, for the, like the rich? Uh, or is it also for um, children, students, lower incomes, who actually has access to this network? to the software and to all the services connected to it or are being or are large parts of the population being excluded by the use of this technology. This is also something which uh, is not really taken into account yet in the cities that we have been looking at. Governance of course comes to uh, immediately to the forefront if you talk about privatized cities. Who is actually governing this city when the whole city belongs to a private corporation? In India we have seen cities which uh, are actually completely governed by the development corporation building the city uh, and all the inhabitants are actually glad that they are uh, because the, the local um, normal governments do such a bad job. So the, uh, the private corporations, they actually deliver. They build the infrastructure, they uh, pick up your garbage, they make sure there's water and electricity. And the normal government doesn't know how to do this. But you could say that this sort of uh, democratic um, a deficit is only acceptable in such a situation where uh, the normal democratic system doesn't really function well. In Western Europe this would be a completely different situation. If you talk about a city, what, what should be the future of our cities, uh, then I think this, this is a, a typically 20th century uh, question connected to the welfare state uh, utopias. They had as a uh, the ground rule that they should be socially inclusive, so meant for all um, income groups, for all groups in population. These new cities don't have that. So they lead to a kind of segregation in which the metropolis, 
uh, is basically poor and um, uh, poor, polluted and, and, and difficult. And everyone who can afford it uh, and has the money to do so moves out to these uh, new cities. So this idea of social diversity and inclusivity which we've always um, um, highly um, appreciated and thought of as very important, is now uh, disappearing. So is there a way that these cities could also be socially inclusive? And is there a way to combine that with a commercial uh, product which a city is becoming? This is uh, uh, also a question which has not been uh, answered uh, up to now. And I think it's very important if you look in the, in the long run, uh, this idea of uh, this, this, this effect of segregation could have very long-lasting uh, results. And, of course, if we're talking to ourselves, professionals in the field of architecture and urban planning, we should also ask what actually is the role of architects and designers in these new uh, cities? Is it basically to uh, give shape to the CBD, to design uh, a number of uh, skyscrapers, to design the museum, perhaps, or the other attractions uh, which uh, the city uses to uh, attract visitors and um, investment and uh, capital and etc. I think the, the community of uh, professionals should re-engage with what you could call the banality of good. And this is actually a quote from the historian Tony, Tony Judd, who uh, was referring to the 20th century pride that designers, but also politicians and policymakers took in being engaged with the banality of everyday life, being the provider of um, housing for the masses, of uh, things which were not glamorous and not particularly sexy, not particularly beautiful even, but very necessary. And this banality is something that uh, our community is now not really engaged with anymore, but they should be.